We're going to start uh, this message on church leadership in a weird spot. I wanted to show you a picture of a fractal, and you guys have probably seen this one before. It's the uh, Mandelbrot set, and fractals are these um, images that we can generate using fairly simple mathematical or even logical rules. Video team, there we go. And they may look complicated when we zoom out and we look at the big picture, but fundamentally they are composed of very simple equations. Even this one looks fairly complicated, but it doesn't involve anything more than multiplication and addition in literally one line of text. And it looks fancy when it's colored, but if it's just in black and white, you can see that it's basically the same thing. It has these repeating patterns. It has these patterns that are self-similar. In fact, you might even have made some yourself. Sierpinski's triangle is a fairly simple, mathematical, even logical fractal that you can make. All you have to do is you have to draw a triangle inside of a triangle. And when you have a triangle, you draw another triangle inside of it. And you keep going and going and going. And what you'll notice here is that these fractals, they, um, they look the same the longer and the further that you go down. So they are self-similar the deeper you look. And once you zoom out to the very end, once you zoom out to the whole picture, you can see that it makes a very beautiful pattern. And this isn't by accident that we make these kinds of creations. In fact, the entire world is full of fractals, and you've probably seen them. You've just never thought of them that way. If you have frost on your window in the morning, you'll have fractals. You can see that each individual uh, stem of the icicle spreads out, and each one looks like that main stem. You've got cauliflower that looks like it's made by aliens. When you look at rivers from the zoomed-out view a few thousand miles above the earth, you see that it's made up of little rivers that feed into bigger rivers that feed into bigger rivers. And if you look at one uh, that's really, really zoomed in, it kind of looks like the big one, and that's on purpose. And all of this was created by God, and I don't think it's an accident that when we look at the idea of leadership, it reflects much the same pattern, the same pattern that we see here. And when thinking about the way that God would instill a pattern of leadership in the world, we can find these fractals there, this, these leadership fractals. And the way that we see it is through hierarchies. We've got a few people who are responsible for some kind of task, and above them is an individual who is managing, who is helping, who is guiding that task. And then you get a bunch of those individuals who are guiding and managing those tasks, and above them you've got an individual. And we talk about that as like maybe a corporate um, organization chart. Maybe it's something else that we see. And this organization chart, it seems to, to look very similar on the lowest levels that it does on the highest level. As we zoom in down, down low, we can see that we've got these workers and above them is an individual. But when we get to the very top, we see that we've got a CEO. He's got individuals underneath him, but he doesn't have anybody over him, right? But he does. And we say, well, this is the way that it's supposed to be, right? I mean, it's obvious that this is the way that it's set up. And I say to you, it's not obvious. There's no real reason why it has to be set up this way. Why can't we have an inverted pyramid? Why can't we have 100 people guiding two people? Or why can't we have um, an organization that is guiding just one person? Why do we have to set it up this way? And I'd say this is the way that God instilled, this is the way that God created order in the world, is through these authority fractals. And when we zoom out in the very highest level, what we can see is we can see God looking over everything. God is above all people. He's above all nations. But then we go down a little bit level and we see that we've got presidents who are in charge of entire nations, one over many. We've got governors in charge of states, one over many. We've got mayors in charge of cities, one over many. We've got church leaders in charge of church members, one over many. We've got Families where the father is in charge of the family, one over many. Even when we look into our own bodies, we've got a brain, and it's one over many. And God's implementation for leadership, it, it lets us see that there's something bigger. We might think that the only thing that we can see above us is the person who's uh, telling us what to do, telling us what not to do. But if we zoom out to the big picture, there is some big picture. There's this Mandelbrot set, this, this beautiful image that can be made once we see the big picture, and oftentimes we don't. And at every level, we can say, well, 
The way that God organized it, it it's, it's not the smart way. It's not the right way because God made it in such a way that we've got these imperfect leaders. We've got these people who stumble, who fall, who don't do what they're supposed to do, do the things that they're not supposed to do. How can God possibly create a structure that would be so corruptible? And yet he did. And the way that he set it up and the way that scripture lays out leadership is in this way. And we've got leaders on top of leaders on top of leaders. And when we talk about why, why, why does this church leadership, why does this organizational hierarchical structure exist? And in the end, it really comes down to God wanting the church to fulfill its purpose. A couple of weeks ago, literally, we talked about the church and its purposes. It's uh, just to remind you to worship, to support one another, and to love the world that is around us. And what God's vision for leadership allows people to do is to put that mission, to put those goals into practice. The purpose of the church is to glorify God, and the purpose of church leadership is to guide us in glorifying God. And church leadership is described in Scripture as being composed of two groups. We, we might break it down into more ways of disaggregating people, but fundamentally, Scripture talks about just two groups, and that's what we're going to be talking about today. It talks about elders or overseers. Those are what we know as pastors. There's the ones that teach, the ones that encourage, the ones that help us out, the ones who, who guide us in some way, and you've got deacons. They're not the ones implementing the visions, but they're the ones who are helping with the vision. They're helping the pastors carry out the mission of the church. So if you've got your Bibles, let's read the passage in 1 Timothy 3.1. It is a trustworthy statement. If any man aspires to the office of overseer or pastor or elder, it is a fine work he desires to do. An overseer then must be above reproach. The husband of one wife, temperate, prudent, respectable, hospitable, able to teach, not addicted to wine or pugnacious, but gentle, peaceable, free from the love of money. He must be one who manages his own household well, keeping his children under control with all dignity. But if a man does not know how to manage his own household, how will he take care of the church of God? And not a new convert so that he will not become conceited and fall into the condemnation incurred by the devil. And he must have a good reputation with those outside the church so that he will not fall into reproach and the snare of the devil. Deacons likewise must be men of dignity, not double-tongued or addicted to much wine or fond of sordid gain but holding on to the mystery of the faith with a clear conscience. These men must also first be tested. Then let them serve as deacons if they are beyond reproach. Women likewise be dignified. Women deacons likewise be dignified. Not malicious gossips, but temperate, faithful in all things. Deacons must be husbands of only one wife and good managers of their children and their household. And I want, as we just read this passage, I want you to, Pay attention to a few similarities. We've got these two lists of requirements, one's for the pastor and one for the deacons, and you'll notice that there's a lot of overlap, and that's because they carry very similar burdens. Not the same burdens, but very similar ones. And naturally, those who are in a more prominent office, those who are in, over, in authority over a larger number of people, they have greater responsibilities. They're, uh, they're held to a higher standard. Deacons have lesser responsibilities, so they're held to a lesser standard, but... There's still a set of requirements. There's still something that signifies that this person is doing the work of God. And this restriction that we read here, it talks about overseers being men, and it talks about deacons being either men or women. And I'm not going to stand up here and apologize for God and say, look, he didn't know what he was doing. He's obviously not in our modern times, because this does not jive with what is currently around us. It's a, the question always comes up, well, why did God design it this way? Why, why is God saying that the men will lead the church, but the women can help, uh, other men can help? Why, why can't a woman lead? And I, I don't know. But I understand that there was a certain set of rules, a certain set of restrictions that God said, look, if you follow this pattern, if you follow this pattern that I set up, when you make this fractal of love, this fractal of um, authority, this fractal of leadership, I will be at the top of it and it will make sense. It will look exactly as it should. And if we come in and we tweak, we tweak that formula and we think, you know, we know better. 
Something has changed, something has become different that these standards no longer apply. We will instead mess up the entire picture. And elders are written in here as men and I want you to understand that there is a distinction between elders being men because that was what they were required to do or appointed to do and them being leaders because they're the smartest and the most brilliant and the most gifted and all of those things. That's not what it says here. In fact, we can very confidently claim that there are people in this room who are smarter than the pastors, who are smarter than the leaders, and they might be men, they might be women, that does not make them good leaders or that does not make them those who should be in leadership. It's just a fact of life that there are imperfect men who will lead us, yet they were put there by God. And ladies, this isn't a assault on your abilities and a statement that, oh, you can't do the job that a man can do. That is not the claim that Scripture is making here. It's not making that claim. And I can tell you for a fact that there are women who are smarter than me. I married one. She tells me and she proves it to me every single day that she knows things and she sees things that I don't see. It doesn't make her the better leader or makes her the one that's supposed to be in the family as the leader. It just says I have to be there and I have to be careful about what I do because there's a person who is a lot smarter and a lot wiser than me who's going to knock me down a few rungs if I start getting a little bit hoity-toity here. And that's okay. And the church exists in the same way. It's not to push people down. It is instead to reflect this design that God made. And he says in his word, if you follow these steps, these are the requirements. These are the rules. This is what you have to do. You have to draw a triangle within a triangle. And if you do that, and you do that as deep as you go all the way to the unit of the family, you will have a structure that will be immovable, that will stand against any kind of temptations and any kind of troubles and any kind of upheavals that you might have in your life. But when you start drawing a triangle and then you say, well, here we can draw a circle and here we can draw a square, you end up with something that does not look like God intended. Now, these rulers, these men who are here, what do they look like? What is their role? What is their purpose? How are they supposed to act? And verse 1 gives us the first bit of information, that they have to be properly motivated. It talks about these men who are aspiring to do a good work. And these elders, they are, they are men in the church who aspire to the office, and it is not a call to power or authority. It is not a call. If you're aspiring to become an elder or a deacon, it is not a call to authority. And I'm going to be talking a lot here about elders and deacons and pastors, and you're going to say, I am none of those things. I, I have no aspirations. I have no gifts. I'm not able to do this. If you have any kind of family, if you have any kind of authority, if you are a manager at work or you are a father at home, these principles, I can change this message. I can cross out elder, deacon, elder, deacon, and replace with mom, dad, mom, dad, mom, dad, and this message will almost word for word make exactly as much sense. So this applies to you even if you have no such aspirations. And elders in the church, they aren't put there in a place of authority. They should not aspire there for authority. And Jesus, even in his time here on earth, he said, look, the rulers of the earth, they aspire to lord over one another, and don't let it be the same with you. Don't aspire to a specific office. Don't aspire to a specific responsibility because you want to rule over somebody, because you want to feel important. Even recently, Pastor Leo, he was, he was talking to um, the deacon candidates, and he was saying, if you want to become a deacon, if you want to be a person who leads, remove the impression in your mind, whatever it might be. In fact, if you even have a hint of seeking power or authority or being someone or being counted as someone, just leave now. This isn't the place for you. And authority, this authority that we are given, this authority that the elders and the deacons have, it is one that is mimicked in Christ. If we zoom out a few levels in this fractal, if we look at the Serpinski triangle, this, this God's triangle, and we look, we can see a reflection of this type of leadership in Jesus. He said, look, I came here to do what? I didn't come here to rule. I came here to die for you. And the reality is that a good leader, a good elder, should be a person who comes out and says, I will gladly take the place of authority. I will gladly take on the responsibility, not so that I can lord, but I, so, so I can die for these people. So I can sacrifice my time, my effort, all of my, the things that God gave me for a specific type of people, not so that I'll have power over them, but so they'll have power over me. That means you shouldn't be 
letting anyone lead you in family or in church who isn't willing to die for you. It's a very high standard that has to be met by an individual in order for you to accept leadership over them. Ladies, this is super important. Single ladies, this is super important. If the person that you are dating, if the person that you're engaged to is not the kind of person that is ready to die for you, and you'll notice it, the little flags will come up, don't disregard them. If that person is not ready to die for you, then they are not a good leader. And if a pastor comes in, if an elder comes in, and he's not ready to die for the church, he will not be a good leader. But that doesn't mean for both the ladies and for the rest of you that you get to kill your pastor. That is not what the Bible says. You don't have the right to burden them, to take so much from them that they feel like they're exhausted. That's not the point of a leader. The point of a leader is to guide with wisdom, but also for the church to support them. The fact that they're ready to die does not mean that you guys are standing there with a guillotine. Don't let the pastors, don't let the leaders, don't let the deacons do everything for you. You have a responsibility as well. You have a burden to carry despite not having that authority. You have a responsibility to help despite being, um, not being in a place that you necessarily have authority. And William Shakespeare, he, um, he had this quote that I decided to uh, reinvent for myself. Some are, born, some are born great, some achieve greatness, and some have greatness thrust upon them. Uh, William Shakespeare uh, my quote, some are born leaders, some achieve leadership, and some have leadership thrust upon them. Anatoly Russ, you can quote me on that. Don't let the fear of having to die for somebody dissuade you for aspiring, for pursuing a place of leadership. You're going to look at your friend on the right and you're going to be saying, I'm not dying for this guy. This guy does not deserve my life. And I'd say, they deserve your life if you're capable. They deserve for you to give the gifts that you have acquired from God, that God gave you at birth, to use them for the benefit of the person to your left and to the person to your right, if you are able. And most of us here are able. We are able-bodied, we are able-minded, and we are able to do this thing. The second thing that um, this passage talks about when it talks about elders and deacons is that an overseer must be above reproach. It mentions the same thing about deacons, that they have to be dignified men. And this doesn't mean that they are perfect men. This doesn't mean that they are without any kind of sin, that there isn't anything in their life that they're working on. It just means that there is no glaring sin. There is nothing that controls them in, the, in an obvious and fundamental way. It means that they struggle because I promise you that the pastors and the leaders and the deacons, they all have their troubles and they all have their problems, but there's nothing that controls them to such a degree that it inhibits their relationship with God. And this is why one of the reasons when we elect pastors, when we elect deacons, what do we do? We go out and we collect signatures and we say, this person would be a good leader. This person would be a good pastor. And we collect signatures and we say, we'd like to see this position, person in a position of power. So that when the voting ro roster comes by and it's like, wait, this guy's going to be the pastor? No way. We're going to find another church. There is a desire to, uh, to draw people out of the church to lead Verse 12, uh, verse 12 for deacons and for pastors as well. He has to be a one-woman man. And this is very clear. I'm not going to go into explaining it. It just means that this is a person who is devoted to their spouse, whether for deacons and devoted to their wives, for elders, for pastors. Prudent and self-controlled. Uh, self elders must be temperate, prudent, and respectable. And verse 8, deacons likewise must be men of dignity, not double-tongued or addicted to much a wine or fond sword gain. And this means that an elder, a leader, a father is not controlled by the things there. And there's a lot of different things that we can be controlled by, things that are obvious and things that are not obvious. And what a leader, an elder, a deacon, what characteristics they exhibit is, for example, they know how to relax, but they're not lazy. They like good food, but they're not gluttons. They work out to maintain their body, but they aren't pursuing a six-pack. They like gadgets and toys and quads and all of those things, but those aren't the things that ruin them financially. There's so many things that we can look at. And one of the things that men especially or those who are high achievers try to pursue is financial abundance. And 
Scripture talks about us seeking to get out of financial dependence. And um, I found a chart that had a bunch of different levels. And he, here are the levels that it kind of broke it down to. Financial dependence is when you don't earn enough money to support yourself. You live in your basement, parents' basement. Maybe you're four years old and you need them to feed you still. There's financial dependence in that area. And you desire to escape that. Any person would desire to escape that. And you get to the point of financial stability where you earn enough to support yourself, you have a little bit of savings. Now, I don't know what the marker is where the person's love of money overcomes them and controls them, but beyond this point is where the danger zone lies. There's financial independence where you have enough income that the investments that you made, they support your lifestyle. And eventually you can get to financial abundance where you have so much money, you have so much acquired wealth, you have so much investment, that any dream that you can dream of, you can make it happen. And at that point, I would say, that's the point where money has taken control of you. And scripture specifically talks about that point. Now, between stability and abundance, there's a lot of gray. And I'm not going to say that you fall into one or the other, but that is something to be wary of. And I don't know what the cutoff is for prudence, but it is there. And in order to be this person, in order to be prudent, in order to be wise, in order to be self-controlled, you have to be able to look at yourself and say, these are the things that I am at risk of being controlled by. I can look at myself and I can say, these are the things that I constantly struggle th with. These are the things that I constantly stumble on. And you have to make plans to be a good, if you want to be a good leader, to avoid those things either completely or to know when they are coming towards you and to find some way of distracting yourself, of avoiding it, of going a different direction. Prudence and self-control. The next one it mentions is being hospitable. Now, ladies, I know you guys are thinking that, oh, this means that your house is decorated in season. You've got jasmine for the spring. You've got pine for the winter. I couldn't think of any other ones for fall, summer and fall. You guys, there's some plant that belongs on the kitchen table for fall and spring, uh, for fall and summer, but I couldn't think of it. That's not what it talks about being hospitable. Hospitality means welcoming people into your life. It means looking at a person and saying, look, you are in need. I can see that you are struggling. Come and I will be the person that you can, the, that you can console with that I can give you comfort. That's what hospitality means. It means that you have a genuine concern for the people who are under you. And that applies to both pastors and deacons, but that also applies to parents, to mothers and fathers. When you look at your child and you say, my, there's something that my child needs that they can only get from me. And you strive and you struggle and you look deep into their heart and you want to have that connection where you can say, I see that there's something wrong with your soul. I see there's something wrong with you. Come. I can be your refuge. I can be the place that you find comfort. Ability to teach. And that one, again, it's fairly straightforward. It literally means that. It means that when you open up the word of God and you've got a question, you can come to a leader, you can come to a pastor, and you can ask, what does this mean? And some of these questions, they might be hard type lessons. What does this Greek word mean? What does this uh, you know, Hebrew word mean? They might be questions that are soft, skilled questions where it's like, what do I do in this situation? How do I deal with this trouble in my life? And that's where pastors come in. They're able to teach. And regardless of where you are in your life, whether you stumbled upon some wall by your own actions or a wall has been placed in front of you by the actions of others, a leader, a pastor will be a person who can help you through that uh, period. Gentle and peaceable. Not addicted to wine or pugnacious, but gentle, peaceable, free from the love of money. It's speaking specifically about elders here. Now, we might look at that state and, we, and uh, might wonder one of two things. What does the word pugnacious mean, and what does it mean to be gentle? Pugnacious, all that it means is that you're willing to fight. You see a um, person who did something wrong, and you're ready. You got your fists up, you're going to go after them. You see a disagreement, and you're like, I know I'm right. I'm going to prove them right. I'm ready. Yet it contrasts this with gentleness and we might assume and we might swing this needle to the other extreme and we might say, well, if I'm not ready to fight, then I have to be a rug that everybody walks over. And that's not what it's talking about here. It's not talking about two extremes where you're ready to fight or you're just ready to lie down at a moment's notice. A leader has to be strong enough to fight for the things that are important, but also gentle enough to seek peace in the end. It ends with peaceable. That means the end result of any fight the end result of any disagreement is peace. 
It's not to prove oneself right. It's not to prove somebody else wrong, but it's to find peace. Again, for fathers, for uh, mothers, for those who have anybody underneath them. Your goal is never to submit somebody. It's never to make somebody obedient to you by force. The purpose is to find peace, to find a place where you can have comfort and you can have quietness, whether it's in your home or in your church. And this difference, it's very, this difference, it's very obvious with kids. If I bring a pair of boxing gloves home, my, kid, my boy, he's four years younger than my daughter. He's underweight by about 50 pounds. She's got a two-to-one advantage on him. But if I give him boxing gloves, he's going to think, finally, I have an advantage over my sister. I am going to make her peaceful my way. And that's not wisdom. That's not leadership. It's me having boxing gloves and saying, I'm not going to submit my kids that way. That's not the way that you interact with children. It's choosing to go the peaceful route, to go the gentle route. And this is the kind of Christ-like thinking that Scripture encourages because this is the example that we were given. We were given this example through this fractal of leadership where Christ showed what it's like to be a pastor, what it's like to be a leader. And there come times where the pastor has to look out for the sheep, where those who come in who are not of the church, who are not a believer, and they try to kidnap, they try to damage the church. And the pastor has to be gentle, peaceable, non-pugnacious, but they have to stand for their flock. They have to look out, and they don't have to shoot at the sheep. They're not, their goal is not to shoot at the sheep. Their goal is to shoot at the wolves. But there are also moments, there are also moments where the wolves come in, and you have to be constantly on the lookout. And a pastor, a good leader, isn't looking for a place to smack the hands of those who are under them, but looking to build them up and protect them from what is on the outside. The next one, he must manage his household well. And deacons must be husbands of, wife, uh, of one wife and good managers of their children in their own household. And there's an interesting phrase that we read here. It says submission with dignity. There there are multiple ways to submit somebody under your authority, but it says submission with dignity, not just submission. And it comes down to this, uh, the way that God designed leadership. It means that the home is a trial run for the church. The home is a trial run for the business. The home is a trial run for your relationship with your friends. And if you can't manage a household well, the, pers- the people that you promise to love, the people who carry either your genetic information or were loved enough that you adopted them into your family, if those people are not ones that you can love, that you can tolerate, the church and a pastor or a deacon position isn't the place for you. If you, can d- if you can't lead such desirable people, people that you love so much, how are you going to th- lead the church? And you have to remember that The fractal, if it gets messed up, if the rules get messed up on the very bottom. If the leader can't lead at home, the leader won't be able to lead in the church. If you can't lead at home, fathers, your leadership is pointless. Mothers, if you break out in anger against your children, your leadership is pointless. It breaks that design that God had from the very beginning, that design that he established for what it's supposed to look like so that each level looks right. So you build and build and build, and in the very end, you have a beautiful portrait instead of a messed up portrait. And for men, oftentimes, that means that we have to cut away me time, us time, man time. It means that when we come home, we don't devote our times to a side hustle. Your side hustle is actually your job. Your main hustle is your family. That means when you come home, you devote time to your children. When your children go to bed, your wife um, should be happy and relieved to have you there. Her second shift does not start when you come home, and now she's got to take care of the kids and you. Her shift ends when you come home. And there has to be time for your wife as well, for your spouse as well. When you come home and you take care of her, and you might say, well, when do I take care of me? It's like, well, congratulations, you've taken care of the kids, you've put them to bed, you've taken care of your wife, you've put her to bed, now it's time to put yourself to bed. And if you want some me time, there's 5 a.m. in the morning when you can get up and you can have a few hours of me time if you really, really want it. And oftentimes, we'll treat our family as the side hustle. 
We'll treat our family as the thing that we focus on secondarily. I'm exhausted from work. What am I supposed to do at home? I'm supposed to relax there, and that's not what Scripture talks about. And you have to understand, if you mess up this fractal at the most simple level, if you mess with the rules at the most simple level, the picture gets distorted. If, you, if I come to this place and I say, I don't care for my family, I don't take care of my family, I sure won't be taking care of you. If I can't take care of the people that I love at home, I'm sure not going to be able to take care of you. If I don't take care of the people that I swore my life and my love to, I'm definitely not going to give my life and love to people who I never made that promise to, at least explicitly. Elders and deacons have to be mature believers. About elders it says that they must not be a new convert so they will not become conceited. Of deacons, it says these must also first be tested. And what that means is that the elders and the deacons, the pastors who lead you, they are individuals who have been through life. Each one of them either had a thorn in their life that cut deep or they currently have it. And it might be sickness, it might be a wayward child, it might be a myriad of other problems, but they've been through life and they can speak into your life. And most of us won't experience Job levels of struggle, but there is some trouble in our lives. And what that does for a leader, what that does for a father, what that does for a parent, there are those of us who are parenting now who are going through a lot, even today. And what that shows us is any faith that we had in ourselves was misplaced faith. What it shows to the pastor, what it shows to the leader, the reason why they're in a position that they're at is because they see that there is nothing that they can do. They don't have any impact on their life. They can't have any impact on the lives of others without God, and they realize and they submit to that. There's an old Russian hymn that my dad used to love to sing. It was, Oh, what a poor sinner. Oh, what a poor sinner. And I used to think that it was a Russian song. It's not. It's a German song. And it was translated into Russian. And it was originally written by Nicholas Ludwig Goff. And there was a verse in that song. And it said, Let me be poor in spirit before you, that I might seek you and live by you. Пусть я буду бедным духом при тобой, чтоб тебе нуждаться и дышать тобой. Let me be poor in spirit. And I asked my dad, and I said, Dad, this, this verse, it doesn't make sense. Shouldn't we be praying to God and saying, God, give me strength. Let me stand on my own two feet. Let me be the person that I want to be so that you will be proud of me. And what God says, I don't want you to be that person. You are not going to make a good leader if people come to you and you say, this is what I did. This is what you should do. This is why I'm great. This is how you should aspire to be like me. This is why. This is why. And that is not the person that God wants. That is not the person that God wants for you as parents. And that is not the person that God wants in a role of authority in the church. The person that God wants to parent your children and the person that God wants to lead a church is a person who comes before God and says, oh, what a poor sinner I am. Oh, what I can't do with myself. Why do I keep falling? Why do I keep struggling? Why do I have to keep coming to you, God? And then you realize, because God, you are the one that sustains me. You are one, the one that gives me strength. You are the one that guides me in life and you're the one that shows me that I am nothing before you. And a mature believer understands that. You can never stand tall before God Almighty. Almighty, Only a fool would dare to do that. A good leader, a good elder, a good deacon has a good reputation. And he must have a good reputation with those outside the church. And for deacons, he must have a good reputation with those outside the church so that he will not fall into the reproach and snare of the devil. And it's one thing to convince those with whom you share like-minded goals and pursuits. And it's something completely different to convince someone who does not carry the same belief system as you. It's one thing to convince a person, look, I'm legit because I do all of these things. And you, you might look at me and you might say, yeah, he's legit. He does all of these things. But what about the people? What about your neighbors? What about your coworkers? I want to be the kind of person that they say about me, that guy's legit. I don't agree with him. He, he's a little weird. I don't agree with him, but he is legit. 
And that's what it talks about when it talks about a good reputation. It doesn't mean that the world agrees with you, but it means they respect you and they respect what you stand for. My, parent, my dad, he lived in his, ho- uh, in his parents' house and they had a neighboring family. Now, my dad's family was large. They had about 12 kids. And this neighboring family, they had one or two. And they were members of the Communist Party, so they had good jobs and they had good authority and they had good perks of being part of the system that existed in the Soviet Union. My dad's parents, they had 12 kids. They were Baptist. And the parents of and the, those neighbors, they would look over the fence and they would say, what kind of weirdos are you? Why are you breeding poverty? The word Baptist to them was a slur. But the years went on. And what they saw is that those 12 kids, they went on to have families. Those 12 kids, they went on to have kids who were obedient to them. And my dad recalls a conversation that he had with the son of that, of that neighbor. He eventually did come to church, and the thing that convinced him is that his mom came up to him, and he said, and I don't remember what his name was, let's call him Lyosha. She said, Lyosha, what are you doing? Look at, look at this Baptist family. They've got kids. They've got families. They're respectable people. You go hang out with alcoholics. Like, what are you doing with your life? I would rather you be a Baptist than you would go with them. And that's the kind of witness. She used that as a slur. She said, I'd rather you go and be with those Baptists, but don't be an alcoholic. Don't continue your life as it is. That speaks to a certain truth that we can have, a certain impact that we can have on the lives of those around us. They'll look at us and they'll say, they're crackpots, but they're respectable crackpots. And I want to be a respectable crackpots. They're like the people who compete in the BMX races and all the extreme sports. We look at them and we say, those people are nuts. Man, how much I want to be like them. Having a good reputation with the world around you is that type of feeling. Where they look at you and they say, they are nuts. But I want to be that kind of nuts. And what you'll notice is as we've been going through this list, there was only really one skill that was mentioned. The reason why I encourage those who are able to lead, those who are able to serve, to serve, is because this entire list that we read in 1 Timothy has only one skill. The rest are traits of character. They're traits of who we are as people. They're not what we can do. They're not the skills that we possess. They are the nature, the character that we have within ourselves. And it's more about that than skill. So what do individuals like that What do elders and deacons, what does church leadership, what does parental leadership do? If you could turn with me to 1 Peter chapter 5. It talks about the responsibilities of these men. Therefore, I exhort the elders among you as your fellow elder and witness of the sufferings of Christ, and a partaker also of the glory that is to be revealed. Shepherd the flock of God among you, exercising oversight, not under compulsion, but voluntarily according to the will of God, and not for sordid gain, but with eagerness, nor yet as lording it over those allotted to your charge, but proving to be examples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the unfading crown of glory. You younger men likewise be subject to your elders and all of you. Clothe yourselves with humility towards one another, for God is opposed to the proud, but gives grace to the humble. These elders, these deacons, these leaders in the family, these leaders in the world, what they're supposed to do is shepherd the flock. And you'll notice that it doesn't give you a definition of what that shepherding looks like. It just says, do it. Go out and implement this care as scripture defines it in the way that is culturally appropriate to you. That doesn't mean that you get to do whatever you want. Verse 3 says, Nor yet as lording it over the allotted in your charge. You don't shepherd by being the Lord over them. You don't shepherd by being a controlling entity. It means that whatever you do, do it in love. Do it as one who is serving, not under compulsion, but doing it out of free will so that you can achieve the goal that Scripture lays out. And I know a lot of people, they get frustrated with that. Because there isn't a specific way of shepherding a certain person, people often get discouraged in the church as a whole. They say, this church doesn't have what I'm looking for. There's not enough um, 
There's not enough focus on building a connected church, a church family. And then others will say, well, this church, I don't want to go there because their church family is basically a cult. You have other people who say there's not, a, there's not enough programs for the kids' ministry, for the youth, for the teens, for the singles ones, for the singles two, for those people, for these people. And then you go to another church and they're like, wow, they've got programs for anything except for Bible reading. I'm not going to that church. You have churches where people say, oh, your VBS program is so lame. There's not even a dragon in the, f- f- yeah, in the foyer. And others are going to say, you guys are having a heretical amount of fun for VBS. I'm not going to that church. And this difference, it occurs because there's different ways of shepherding a flock. And to some people, a certain approach works. And for others, a different approach works. And it doesn't mean that one is worse and one is better. It just means that they're different. And there's a large range of acceptable ways that elders and deacons can lead a church. And it doesn't mean that they're wrong or right. And in fact, if you have a better way of doing it, aspire to the role of elder or deacon. Follow the scriptural passages. And the end goal is always to fulfill the command. The end goal is always to care, to protect, and the shepherd, the flock. That is the purpose of a leader. Now for some leaders... And for some sheep, what that might entail is you catch that sheep, you grab it, you tie its legs up so that it won't kick you, you put it on your shoulder so it doesn't run away, and you bring it back to the flock. Sometimes that's what shepherding entails. It means being straightforward with people who don't like you being straightforward with them. But the goal is caring. The goal, goal is loving. And sometimes that applies to our families as well. Where shepherding the flock means that you take drastic actions. You do things that are in the best interest of your children. You do it in the best interest of your family. Not because you have power, but because you have love. The next thing that they do is teach. And again, like I said, this is the only thing that is listed as a skill. Everything else is listed as a character trait. And if your character and your desire to serve the church are in the right place, there is a place for you in church. If you have the right character, if you have the right motivation, there is a place for you in church. And if you can't preach, if you can't teach, that's okay. Nobody's going to put you up here. In fact, we're going to kick you off if you try to get up, if you can't preach. And that's okay. But build up that character within you to desire to serve, to desire to minister. And teaching isn't just about head knowledge. It's not just about laying out some kind of truth. It's not just about saying, well, this is what it means in the Greek and this is what it means in the Hebrew. Teaching means that the elders and the deacons, they can apply it to your life. So that you can come out of this place and you can have some nugget of truth, something that you say, this is what I'm supposed to work on. This is what I need to change. And this is one of the things that I try to antag- uh, agonize over when I prepare my messages. It's like, why does, I, why does it matter to me Why should I care about this message? Because if I don't care about the message, you guys aren't going to care about the message either. If I don't care about the word that I'm preaching, you're not going to care about the word that I'm preaching. If you don't see the point in what I'm saying, I probably didn't see the point in what I was saying. And I struggle over that and I try to overcome it. And we often look at those who exercise some authority over us. And we don't realize the amount of time and anxiety that has gone through their life how much they've agonized over difficult questions, how much they've debated a certain course of action. And we can look up and we can say, I can do better. We can go around the restrictions. We can, we can skirt what we're supposed to do and what we're not supposed to do. We can technically be okay while at the same time completely disregarding what was instructed to us, what was given to us. We're capable of doing that. That is not beyond the realm of possibility, but we should not. Because when we do that, we upset the simple and that elegant balance that God has instilled from the very beginning. And it's very easy to outmaneuver and say, oh, how do I dress? How do I act? What do I do? What do I not do? What things in the gray area in scripture can I do and what can't I? And we can maneuver and we can weasel our way and we can disregard what the leadership of the church says. But in the end, what we're doing is we're upsetting that balance. As the band comes up, I want to show you one more picture. Originally, the picture that I showed you is the Mandelbrot set. This is exactly the same picture, but with slightly tweaked parameters. It's called the burning ship. 
And it looks, and it's called that, as you can see, because it kind of looks like a ship is going under. You've got these masts sticking out of the ground. And it's formed by a specific set of rules. You get this beautiful picture by following a set of specific rules. Now, you literally have to change just a couple variables in order to get the following picture. I call it the splatted frog. You just have to tweak a few little variables, a few little numbers, and you get something that is completely different, completely unintelligible. And I don't want our church to either look like a burning ship or like a splatted frog, but I do desire for us so that we can follow those rules that were set up by Scripture for us. The only way that we will ha it will happen is if we follow the Word of God. On your screen, you're going to see the pastors that lead our church. We have Pastor Leo, Pastor Mike, Pastor Vladimir, Pastor Igor, and Pastor Alexander. Now you'll be surprised to know that none of those men are over 40 years old. I know they look much older. Gray and everything. No, they're, they're older than 40. But we should desire as a church to pray for them. To pray for their leadership that they would enact these principles that are written down in the word of God that they would be men who we are able to follow and desire to follow. And that through that, through the following of those very simple rules, we may glorify God. Amen. Let's stand and I'll give you a few minutes to pray and then I'll conclude. Heavenly Father above, we come before you, Lord, as, as simple people, Lord. And you laid out for us very simple guidelines of what you'd like to see what you'd like to see so that we can build strong families, what you'd like to see so we can build strong churches, what you'd like to see so we can build a world that is the way that you intended it to be. And our sinful nature desires to corrupt it in a million different ways, to do things the way that we think is best instead of the way that you've commanded us. And I pray today that we would become encouraged to follow your word, not because it's said that way, but because we desire to please our Father in heaven. We desire to see that big picture one day, to zoom out and see the beauty that you've created. And let all of us reach that end with our children intact, with our families intact, with the pastors who pastored it and led us, with the deacons who helped and um, assisted and with all of us following in obedience to your word and to all that you have said, amen.